what are those conditions that we need for a, a secure attachment? Well, the and, I, and I'm going to say this because a, a attachment really plays out in a in a relationship. All right. So these five primary conditions that I'm going to talk about, it's for new mothers, like know these conditions. And one of the things, and I will say mothers and fathers and grandparents, et cetera, not just mothers. Okay. But I also want to say that they're going to play out in friendships with women, with friendships with men. They're going to play out when you're dating. They're going to play out when you're in a relationship when you're with your husband. They're going to play out in um, a workplace. So when I talk about these five primary conditions, look at it from the lens of how you want to be in a relationship. And I'm, I'll focus just on the baby mother right now, but you can apply these to any relationship you're in because the, these are about the needs. And I'm going to present them to you, these five primary conditions from the child's perspective. This is what the child needs. For instance, okay? okay. So the first one is felt safety. The child must feel felt safety. This establishes trust. And the behavior of the primary caregiver is protection. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say protection, I don't mean just locking them in a car seat. I don't, I, I don't mean that the parent knows that they're protected. Like that's the, the side of the crib is up. We know they're safe, mm -hmm. but we cognitively know. But that child doesn't really understand that because when a child comes in the world, they start experiencing all of these, these needs, not cognitively, but through their, sensor, their, their, their sense of sensory motor development. Mm -hmm. Right. So a child has to feel safe. And for instance, if a if a loud noise or a child is startled, it causes them to be frightened inside. And so our, our goal is to really understand that and soothe that child back to their to their regulation, mm -hmm. to, you know, to their emotional regulation, because when we're able to do that, that child starts to internalize that. Yes, I'm scared, but someone has come in to help me, which gets which which. which gets kind of internalized in the sense that the world will be safe for me because I've experienced this and I've been, and it's not the end of the world and I'm not alone. I'm not dealing with it by myself. And this is why it's so important. And once again, I want to just back up just for one second and say, it doesn't mean you have to meet your child's every single need. And if you don't like 98%, your child is, it, you failed. No, no, <laughs> no, no. It can feel like a huge tall order to like meet, meet, I mean, yeah, like an infant's needs are so immediate and demanding, but yeah, to meet every single need all the time is, and sometimes then people carry that desire to do that, like when our children are a lot older too. Well, and it also becomes too much pressure on yourself and nobody is perfect. And if you strive for perfection, you're going to fail. You're going to miss the, in, in the big picture. The big picture here is more often than not, just more often than not. Okay. So even if I say 60, 40 or 70, 30, you already feel just already so much more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. More often exactly. than not. Yeah. I, and, I, and I really want to say this. It's more often than not. Okay. Because there's no way anybody can meet anybody's needs 100%. And also you actually do a disservice when you meet someone's needs hundred percent, because just like I talked about that infant study I was in, mm -hmm. what we were filming is how they repair those little disruptions when a child is alone or a child's with a stranger or when they're upset or when they're nervous or when they're scared, you need those moments. So you can have a corrective experience because that's what sets the stage on resilience. And that's what sets the stage on, you know, self-regulation. Mm -hmm. All right. So you don't want to be perfect. You've got to have those inevitable challenges that even as an infant, you've got to have some, in, those inevitable challenges of like, it's, there's a little bit of time until mommy or daddy gets to me or whatever it is um, to, uh, we don't want to like manufacture them, but like, they've, you know, that's life. I love that. Thank you for uh, in, un underlining the importance of like, it's, it's just more than not. Yeah, and we don't have to be perfect. Thank you. No, and I, you know, I'll tell you something. It's too much pressure, and especially as you know, and I'll just say from a a, a mother perspective, because I was a mother, mm -hmm. and not only are we mothers, but we're wives. We're we're either single parents, or we have jobs, or we have other relationships that we're also balancing. So you know, this all inclusive, where you have to meet you know a child's needs at the expense of everything else, it it, it sets you up for failure, and failure doesn't make you feel good about yourself. 
So what I want to present, and especially with attachment, let's focus on the positive. Let me just give you the five primary conditions. So the second one is feeling seen and known. Mm -hmm. Now, feeling seen and known is going to be in the sense that the parent behavior is attunement to really understand the inner state, the, the interstate of your child, what, what, their, what their internal world is feeling. All right. And this is important because a child has one cry. They have a, one cry. And the parent has to kind of decipher, is this a hungry cry? Is my child in pain? Is my child sleepy? Mm -hmm. This is what I mean by attunement. Mm -hmm. And also like when you know, like that's, my child is off. There's something wrong here. It's this intuition that that's just not her. She's acting a little bit odd. That's what I mean by being seen and known. And what that does for a child is it really helps them with their self-development because they know that they have something and there's someone in the world that's really trying to help them figure it out because they don't have the wherewithal to figure it out. So they really need that other to come in and kind of help them. Mm. And this Thanks. is, this is really where that, that mindfulness piece comes in that like presence, like being able to be in a place of curiosity and, you know, kindness and curiosity. Who are you today? Like, let me be curious rather than kind of making the mental shortcuts. Like, let me really see and hear you. I love that. Yeah. So that's the second one. And then the third one is felt comfort. Now the child needs to internalize these feelings. It's not just pick up your child when you're crying and looking at your phone, you're doing an instrumental love, which is picking up your child. Mm -hmm. But if you're not present and mindful with that child to really soothe them and reassure them. So the child gets this internal message that when they're upset, they're going to be comforted. It's not the end of the world. You know, their whole sense of self doesn't crumble. Okay. And that they're going to, their need is going to be met once again, more often than not. Mm -hmm. All right. But what the child starts to understand is that they're going to be taught by the parent behavior how to have emotional regulation. So they'll be able to do that themselves. The whole goal is that they are able to internalize it so they can start self-soothing. And they know that, you know, when they're disappointed, they're able to calm themselves down because they've experienced this so many times before. We don't want to have a child who's never experienced disappointment to be 17 and a half and they get rejected from Harvard. Yeah. That should not be their first disappointment in the world and disappointments when you're 12 months old or you know two years old or three years old those are small disappointments we want a lot of small disappointments that we know how to comfort and soothe so we know that as we get older hey been here before i can do this let me get to the fourth one which yeah, is yeah, feeling yeah. valued and then we can you know take it on but feeling valued is my favorite and i've recently written two books for one is for new parents, which is called The Importance of Love Rays. And it's based on this number four, feeling valued. And the reason why I wrote it is because the only way to create self-esteem in a child is that the child has a sense of accomplishment and that the, the, the parent or caregiver rejoices in that sense of accomplishment. And when you rejoice in that sense of accomplishment, it's called amplifying the affect. And what happens is the child feels really good about themselves. And that's how you create self-esteem in a child. It's not just give a trophy because they showed up for something. That will erode self-esteem because self-esteem is created once again, when you have a sense of accomplishment in the child. And it, when they're young, they have all these little sense of accomplishments. They, they're able to you know, go to their room and get their blanket and bring it to you. That's a sense of accomplishment. Mm. Do you know, they're able to help you with, you know, or help a mother with the, you know, with the newborn by saying, you know, can you go to the room and get, you know, a, a, a diaper for me? The child runs along and brings it back. That's a sense of accomplishment. All right. And children have sense of accomplishment, accomplishments all the time. But this is what creates self-esteem is when you acknowledge those sense of accomplishments. And it's so important. And one of the way you, ways you can do it, and especially with children, because children learn through their eyes, not their ears. All right. So if you give a sense of accomplishment verbally, but you don't show it on your face, there's no joy or happiness coming from your face into your eyes, but you say it. Well, they don't really hear it because they don't see it. 
So the reason why I named my books Love Rays is to send this message that when you look at your child, even if you don't say anything, if you just pour love from your eyes into theirs, they feel good about themselves. Because don't forget, most of this is set before children have a cognitive understanding. So words mean nothing. They're assessing everything in the world by how you present to them. If you come at them with this loving face and happiness, they coo back at you. Mm. But if you come at them because you're stressed, you're busy, and you're just picking them up and have to feed them before your next phone call, that child is going to feel that anxiety. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. when we talk about mindful parenting, we want to really talk about being present in that moment. And that's key. And one of the things that I can't stress enough is love raise. And we know it when you, when you, and just remember that time. And if you haven't, if you're pregnant, I always tell pregnant women this as well. Notice that moment that that child is born and that child is put in your arms. Or if you're an adoptive mother, that child, that time you meet that child, you get this surge of love. And you can't stop smiling no matter how much you try. You're just in awe and wonderment of this little baby. Well, that child is feeling valued in that moment. They don't understand what they're feeling, but it feels good. Mm -hmm. It just feels good. Mm -hmm. So the fourth one I consider to be one of the most important. And once again, you know, felt safety is, is all the time. Seen and known is all the time. It doesn't just happen in infancy. You carry this out through childhood. You carry it out through teenage years when they need it, even though they're being atrocious. You know what I'm saying? And even when they're adults, (laughs) when they're adults and you look at them with love, they feel it. We all feel it. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one is a little bit later. And what this is, is and all of these are internalized. It's from the child's perspective once again. So when that child has experienced that, you know, all by doing these, you know, one through four, what happens is the child gets this, this feeling that they're supported 100%. And when that child gets that feeling, what happens is when they're encouraged to like be who they are and their own interest and what they're about, and it's 100% support, they feel that they can go off in the world and they can find their path. And it's because they really do believe that there's people in the world that want the best for them. And even as I talk, you can even hear like, you know, sometimes the people who don't have this sense of self or this sense of support, and you can, you can hear it and see it. And so much of behavior is around the mind. It's how you think. Catch new episodes of the Mindful Mama podcast and other free resources, including the Mindful Mom Guide at mindfulmamamentor.com. You can listen to every back catalog episode, including interviews with Dr. Dan Siegel, Janla Van Zandt, Sharon Salzberg, and get meditations, join our private Facebook group, and more. Go to mindfulmamamentor.com now. I'll see you there.